Patrick. Welcome to the Happy Job Records. So glad to be here. It's a podcast we have now. I knew you were doing something in your basement. <laughs> and it wasn't murder. Uh, this, is my, this is my friend Terry, my friend and co-host Terry. Hey Terry, Patrick. Terry, how do we how do we land? Um would you do you consider me more friend or co-host? Uh friend. That was definitely. Easy, you you were like right there, you were ready. Yeah, no, definitely friend. It's weird. I have uh you, Russ and I have a dynamic uh similar to what I have with my brother. Don't read too much into that, but uh I can Russ and I have gone like multiple months in the past without speaking. And we get on a call and it's like, you know, just you, we pick up where we left off last time. So I, I, we've gone longer than that. It's there, there have been moments where it was like a year or two. And then you were like, hey, do you want to do a podcast? And I was like, sure. <laughs> Let's do an hour a day for the next year. Right. <laughs> well, we we've we saw each other in December. So True. It, that might have been the that might have been the trigger. Yeah, uh, were, Terry, were just my friend. Were, I was just going to say, were you just talking about how you have wonderful backgrounds for doing video podcasts, both of you? And you're like, uh, I got to do something with these colorful wall behind me. I guess I should have a like, I don't know, like a podcast, like a video podcast. <laughs> yeah, that came first. That was 100 percent. That came first. Uh, Terry, Pat is on today as a test guest and also because he has he has two things. So first, he is a huge baseball fan. How how huge of a baseball fan are you, Pat? Pretty huge, I would say, in the in the American sense. What does that mean? What's the American sense? It's just like that Americans are kind of lazy about everything. You know, like I'm not gonna like make a lot of effort to do it, but like I'm, you know, in the most passive American way possible, I am a large baseball fan. So you know a lot about baseball. You know religiously follow baseball. Yep. You Did have it- opinions about rules of in baseball. Oh, yeah, I do. But you don't necessarily bring up baseball to, to baseball civilians on the street. No, I'm not. I don't, I don't evangelize baseball necessarily. I'm more of a, you know, you do what works for you. I, I uh, have small children, so I don't like, you know, go to any baseball games. But when it's sort of like beamed to the like supercomputer in my pocket, I watch it pretty much every day. Everyday baseball. Pretty much. So that so that's his that's his claim to fame as huge baseball fan, also kind of prone to being a fan of other stuff as well. Uh, specifically, I would say video games and books. Also, a super fan of each of those things. How many books do you read in a given month? Uh, well, let's just say like ten. Ten books a month. So that's a lot. That's uh, ten books a month more than me. <laughs> and I'm not going to put Terry on the spot for how many books a month. And then uh, video games we'll get into last because Terry is less. Terry is Terry's a video game civilian, right? Like I'm the sports civilian. Okay. Terry's the video game civilian. But Terry is also he has a you're a huge baseball fan as well, right, Terry? Yeah, uh, considering that I it it paid for a lot of my undergraduate and um, I've played it basically my entire life. I'm I'm definitely a huge fan. Huge baseball fan. What team do you root for, Terry? The Boston Red Sox. Explain yourself, please. <laughs> so 1986. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> was my first sports team that was mine. And I had been exposed to other teams that my father liked or that other people around the family liked, uh, but the 86 Red Sox and specifically Roger Clemens were, um, my first sports team. And so that was a bad year to break into Red Sox fandom, but it was awful. (laughs) Yeah, it was good. I love, I love Boston. Generally. I love the Red Sox. I like, uh, the fact that they were real bad for a long time and then became like a dynasty franchise even if they're not doing great the past few years they're still worth a lot of money as a franchise yeah and you stuck around long enough to see them rise back to glory this is true pat you're a fan of the uh washington nationals a team Uh which you a team which you did not grow up watching no i i am from arkansas and I grew up with all the various Superstation teams. So I'd catch a little bit of the Cubs, a little bit of the Braves, 
Um, there's a lot of St. Louis Cardinals fans in Arkansas, but the sport I played a little bit uh, when I was younger. But um, my whole family is basically completely sports agnostic, except for myself. And so I had to sort of like teach myself anything I wanted to know about sports. And so I knew a bit about sports. I liked baseball, but I, you know, I certainly didn't have the capacity to follow it regularly. So and baseball, I would say, as a sport really clicks with you when it is the day to day, every day baseball thing, you know, like being the oh, I watch a big game on one game a weekend or something like that. That's not, to me at least, really how baseball is supposed to, you know, how you get the most out of baseball. And so when I, I came to Washington, D.C. for college, all my roommates in college were from New York and were big Yankees fans. Uh, and it was one of those things. It was more like, okay, I want, they really like baseball. I want to, like, know more about baseball and get into it. Um, and then, uh, you know, but I didn't want their team kind of like Terry, you were saying, you don't want, you have to have something that's your own. And then in 2005, they were like, oh, Hey, we're going to like move a team to the place that you live. And that was more, that was pretty big glowing neon sign of like, this is your on-ramp. You're never going to get a better on-ramp than this. And so, you know, from then on, that was, that was my thing. I mean, in the first couple of years, it was almost impossible to actually find the Nats on TV. They only televised like 20, 30 games a year. But you could go down the stadium for a dollar and uh, go in and just, I don't know, walk wherever you wanted to and sit down, you know, wherever you wanted to in the stadium because they didn't. God knows there was enough space. Plenty of space. So, Pat, I have to ask, how long were you in Arkansas before you moved to D.C.? Oh, so from, yeah, so I moved for college. So I was 18, uh, 19 when I moved to college, moved to college. As a fellow Southerner, I have to ask, how did how did you lose the draw? Uh, yeah, you know, it's very funny. My mom is from California, and so for some reason, we, uh, she and I, pick up accents really quickly, and then dis- like sort of discard them quickly. And so, if you met her today, she, it would be the most thick Southern accent in the entire world, even though she's from Loma Linda, California. But if you put her, I mean, I swear, if you put us like in Boston for six months, we would be, you know, like doing hard Oz and talk about the Baba, <laughs> et cetera. It, it's just a very weird thing. And it's not, I'm not making fun of anybody. I just like, you know, kind of like, so I picked up now I picked up the just like vague mid, you know, mid Atlantic accent. But do you but think yeah. it's because you're trying to fit in? Well, and I, I know this about myself because I think I, every once in a while when I was in Arkansas, I left a friend of mine in New York a voicemail once where I was just telling her what I was doing that day. And she played it back for me. And she was just like, one, this is not English that you're saying. It's about <laughs> you and your buddy are going to Walmart to buy bullets so you can go to the <laughs> dam and shoot stuff that's in the back of his blazer. And I was like. Yeah, that's about right. And she was like, well, I was only getting like every third word, but it seemed seemed crazy to me. But yeah. So the, the accent and the content go together. Yeah. Tightly. I, I never heard the story. I, I didn't realize that your super fandom of baseball actually tied with the move to your town of a pro team. So DC has been a sports city since at least the 70s. But it's been very, very heavily Redskins, then Washington football team, <laughs> now the Comanches. Commanders. Did I get that right? Commanders. You can't right. go. You can't go from one bad name to another bad name. <laughs> yeah, that would have been really, really bold move on there. We're yeah. changing the name to Comanches. Oh, with a, with a very heavy <laughs> dose of Dallas Cowboys fandom throughout those decades all around uh, DC. So it's been a sports city for a long time. And I would know as a sports outsider feeling as though other people are watching Cowboys and Indians games. Um, And then, and then I also was a fan of baseball uh, like from a distance, but it was like my, you know, family members took me to baseball. I grew up going to Orioles games. I had um, family that lived in Baltimore and it was also the closest major league stadium. So, you know, I went to a handful of major league games growing up. I remember Camden Yards opening and that being a big deal. Uh, I think that that kind of like started my interest in 
you know, stadium tours as a thing, in addition to like a bazillion other people love stadium tours. So the, the Nats coming was a big deal. I remember going to games the first season, but unlike Patrick, my fandom did not click at all. And I will go season by season, like either, you know, having three fantasy teams and doing the daily baseball thing. But then other, other seasons, I'll just be like, oh, is there baseball now? <laughs> and I, I become quasi-intentionally sports illiterate. So I want to pivot from there into fandom, Patrick. Okay. Tell, t- tell Terry what you did to, to cross the line from a mere fan to a sports journalist on the side. Oh, okay. So... So several years ago, there was a, you know, I'm a white male of a certain age, so I have to have a podcast at some point. So uh, (laughs) several years ago, uh, a close friend of mine and potentially all of y'all's and and I, he and I had a sort of our favorite baseball podcast and it was, uh, it was um, from Baseball Prospectus and, uh, and then they stopped the, the, the podcast because both of them went to go work for major league baseball teams. And the thing we liked about this podcast is it was very like unapologetically, like uh, unapologetically, they just did whatever they were going to do. Episodes would be like two and a half hours long. Uh, They would have an entire, you know, like 60 minutes of the episode was just them comparing uh, particular pitchers, uh, pitches to various Pixies songs, you know, like that was the thing (laughs) that they would do for, for uh for a good while and so then when it when it went off the air um we were just like oh man we missed this so much and then uh his wife was just like you guys should just do a podcast um a baseball podcast so you can just get together and talk and then so we started a baseball podcast called ground rule single and um we got uh every podcast has they have a guy named terry so we got a guy named terry uh and he joined us and then yeah no, I just I think it's I think Terry joining you is funny. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> different Terry, um, and uh, yeah, and so then we did a podcast, and so doing a baseball podcast, you know, is 162 games a year. It's just a lot of weeks, and so it's just it's kind of like what you're doing, which is just like there's just like a real commitment and a grind to it, and so we kept it going. I think for probably three solid years, um, had a. You know, at point there was a point where we were like on the front page of uh, of Apple Podcasts in the sports section. That was pretty cool. We had, um, uh, you know, it was one of those things that we had sort of put. There's many opportunities where we could have said like, "Oh, we'll put more effort into this," and probably could have been like legitimately successful. And instead, we were just kind of like, well, "We just kind of like talking to each other." We had an entire episode once that was just uh, around um, taste testing beers from the Costco variety pack uh, while talking about baseball. Um, one time, uh, Ryan had just completed making a keg of truly awful beer that was extremely high octane. And at first it tasted awful. And then by the end of the episode, we were just pretty much pissed drunk. Um, that was a good time. Um, but, you know, it, we would get thousands of downloads from all over the world. We, we had a... We would call out and say, like, all right, who is the person in Moldova listening to this podcast? I assume you're just trying to steal our credit cards, but please, you know, kind of like <laughs> tell us who you are. And, it, and then somebody wrote in and told us that was their dad and that their dad is a, was like a literature professor at the University of Moldova and was a big baseball fan and listened to podcasts. And he was also would help out with like the old Moldovan men's national baseball team or something like that. So it was a total blast. Uh, you know, highly recommended for people. Who what have- Roughly what year was this? Oh man, this was probably 2012 to 15, probably. And the 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 promo that went into the podcast, other than being consistent about recording it, having a name, having some T-shirts, having a Twitter, there was there was basically nothing else. That was it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and and a lot of it was, I would say, the thing that uh, was it. There's actually an interesting sort of duality to this. So we went to this to this FanGraphs event at Nationals Park. Um, now that FanGraphs is a baseball statistics site that we really liked, and so we went and, to and a, FanGraphs was kind of having a moment at the time, right? They, they still do. Yeah, they're, they they were having they were having an underground. This is the thing that the 
you know, the future Moneyball people and the people that came to baseball as Moneyball fans or were were learning to come to, to, to approach baseball as Moneyball fans. It was like still the cool underground thing that hadn't it hadn't caught on like wildfire yet at that at that time. Yeah. And, they, and I mean, a lot of their people have gone on to be hired by various teams. And so we were at the one in D.C. It, w- it was me and Ryan were there. And we were there, we're talking to like Jay Jaffe and Kevin Goldstein and some of these guys. And with us were these like teenagers who had driven there from like upper Maryland or whatever. And they were just like so in love with baseball, so pumped about doing their own podcast that they were kind of thinking about it at the time. Do, uh, oh, and tossing around names. And they wanted to name it, the, they wanted to name it Cespedes Family Barbecue, which is now they have tens of thousands of subscribers been hired by Fox Sports. They had their own TV show. It's Fox Sports. And it was so funny, kind of a duality there of sitting there of like, oh, two podcasts show up at this fan graphs thing. One, we do it for a while. It's fun. And then we stop. And these guys are legitimately made it a career. But to be totally honest, they just like le- slept and breathed and loved baseball and they loved all of it and they didn't have kids. Right. And so that's <laughs> that was a big part of it that allowed them to sort of focus on what they were doing. Um, one of the things that they did that I thought was really smart actually is, is, um, they also, they would, uh, pay for ads on other podcasts that, you know, that they liked, right? So their favorite baseball podcast, the one time they paid whatever, it wasn't even that much. I think the fee to be the entire ad sponsor of this one podcast episode. And so they were the front, the back and, and the end of this podcast episode. And it drove a lot of traffic to them and they, they've done really well since they're really nice guys. How did you decide collectively and individually how did you decide that like how did, how did you make the choice that you were putting all this effort into your fandom in the sense that it was a regular recurring thing the minimum minimum it required you know scheduling getting together knowing that you were going to talk about baseball at a certain time and that there was you know labor associated with that uh you know recording editing uploading promoting all that stuff how, how did you how did you decide whether to put more work in or put less work in? Was the whole thing an experiment or did you kind of have like a gate where you knew that you were doing it to be a fan, not to be a journalist? Yeah. So it, it was interesting. So maybe like the, the downfall slash end of it was why it continued as long as it did, which was the whole point was talking to my friends about baseball. That was it, you know? And, and like, so that was, that kept us going. That was the passion for it, right? Was just like, I, to this day, if I can get together with those guys and talk about baseball, it's just wonderful. I mean, and I can just, hours will burn by if we're going to do that. And so it was great. It's just, I would say about baseball, the tough thing about, about baseball is it, it is just the grind. It's week after week after week after week. And especially once kids start popping up and we were never going to do it as our sole career at that point, it just, you know, it got the, you could feel yourself giving sort of like not as much energy as it, as, uh, it needed maybe. I mean, don't get me wrong by like, you know, episode 75 of all of it. I was like functionally part of my brain would be asleep while I was doing the intro <laughs> to the episode. It's like, hello and welcome to the ground rule single podcast. And I would talk for like five minutes before I would look up and realize that it was, you know, I had finished the intro and it was time for the bit to go. But still, even, even that far in there are, there's so much in that podcast that is just straight up like me uncontrollably laughing at something hilarious that somebody did or, or having a good bit and the, those sorts of things. And so, it was always worth it. That in the end, that's why it ended up being shut down. Is if it ever felt too much like work and not enough like just having fun, you know, it was never going to be. It was never going to be a source of like. I don't think we ever grossed dollar one on that. We liked seeing ourselves in the front of like Apple Podcasts at that point, but you know that happens. You Terry, know. I see a question on your face. Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to ask, what's the day job? Like, what was if if I may ask, like yeah. what what's what's the the career that pays the bills? All right, so. I am a deputy division chief administrative appeals judge in the, for the social security administration. So I, I adjudicate disability cases. Uh, if very funny, I can't probably say who it is, but, uh, there is a, uh, another, a, a chief judge of something else that I, I know, uh, I just meet more judges and chief judges who have their own secret baseball podcasts. And so anyway, apparently it's a big- <laughs> 
there's a lot of lawyers in podcasting, mainly because lawyers want to do anything else but be lawyers by and large. There's a lot of us out here, is yes. what you're saying. Out in these streets. What were your what were your two co-hosts? What do they do for a living? Uh, One, one's an attorney and both the other lawyers. One was, both lawyers. Oh. Um, oh, I knew that. I knew this. Yeah, but uh, you know, and so we would always make jokes about that. Uh, uh, and so yeah, that's that's the day job is the federal government job. It, it is. Uh, it, I mean, I'd say the kids is what really is robs the energy for all the all the late night recording sessions and the like. I just wonder why we're 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 talking baseball if we've got a judge on the podcast with us. Yeah, we should we should be talking. How is AI and technology making your life hard, or how is it making your life better? No, I want to talk. I want. I want to. I want to make sure that we're covering the cultural aspect of Pat's of Pat's for colored sure. and varied past. We'll we'll have him back for the AI talk. Um, I love talking about our... structured data. See, this is Terry. This is your this is your th- thesis, though, is that the people that know stuff about things like structured data are tucked away in all these different pockets of the world doing a wide variety of different things that then don't naturally have any way to intersect. I don't think we got as far with that thesis as, as to say that the only answer is to talk about baseball on podcasts, but I don't think that's an unreasonable recommendation. Well, lure, lure them out. <laughs> lure them out with baseball talk. <laughs> Baseball is the baseball is absolutely the gateway drug to talking about structured data and how can you use it. And I mean, it, it's such a good way of sort of introing that for people. So like, okay, so something I some stuff I do with with uh, in disability adjudication is looking at quality of. I'm an appeals judge, so I review decisions that are made by administrative law judges at the level below us, and so we're really focused on quality and the concept of hey, you can what is this. I know a lot of data about the decisions made by various judges. There's thousands of judges at the level below us. What is the back of the baseball card stats for this judge? And even talking about it that way, like is revolutionary for some people of saying like, Oh yeah, I don't want to just get overwhelmed with the information about this person. I want to know what are the three most important things to know about the quality of somebody's decision-making or the speed or efficacy of it. And and put those in, put those right at the top of whatever report it is on that person, and it all comes back to baseball. With structure. There's always going to be a situation where you need the left-handed superstar closer of adjudication. I, nobody needs Jonathan Papelbon. I'm sorry. Nope. <laughs> See, this this goes to show how much I know. <laughs> he was uh, was he a Mississippi guy or a Mississippi State guy? I think Mississippi State. I just remember him choking Bryce Harper and that being like a a, a, a real dark moment for the team. <laughs> and yet, uh, he was not in the league much longer after that, if I recall. That was pretty crazy. Yeah. Pat, so how, I, go ahead, Terry. You're the Pat, next question. Go. I was going to ask, how did you land on baseball? Did it? I mean, obviously, it's a beautiful sport and um, there are many facets to the game outside of just the physical competition. There's, you know, especially for fans, um, that, that like to think and kind of track the, the nuance and the story of the game. There's a, there's a lot of culture outside the actual physical competition. What landed for you? I mean, obviously there are many sports around your area. How did, how did baseball stick? You know, I think it kind of links up with what you were what you were talking about the about the '86 Red Sox, which is like you feel invested in something when you can gr- kind of grow with it. This is not to take a shot at people who skip around to the best team out there or whatever, but like the Nationals in 2005, we were abjectly horrible, right? Like we were just terrible. And if you go through that for just years and you looking for, I mean, I remember being legitimately overjoyed one year when we finally won our first game of the year, like seven games into the season, it was like, okay, well, we're not going to go over, right? Like, uh, but it, it, it just, it was like, you've been through these struggles. It was a very, I mean, still to this day, a very, very emotional moment for me when we first, when we finally won the division in, um, I think 2011, 2012 was the first year we'd won the division, but to come from just being just the worst team in baseball, the, 
we misprinted our jersey so it said Natinals, and the guys went out there <laughs> wearing the Natinals jersey. We were just so the stadium is physically co- collapsing into the ground. Yeah, and rats. it's it's too large. So every time you go to a game, even if the team was good, they wouldn't be able to to really fill it on a on a yep. weekday in August. And it's it's worse than that because they're terrible. So there's it's terrible barely anybody there. My my inaugural season Washington Nationals souvenir cup served almost a decade of duty as the uh, as the toilet brush holder in oh, my house. Well, that's, that's that's pretty reasonable based on how we played. But you know, and then and then then you had the first sort of gleamings of a turnaround. You know, we drafted Strasburg, we got Harper. Um, through a totally ridiculous scenario, I knew enough about baseball and knew enough about the Nats at that point that I was able to sort of accurately project when they would bring Strasburg up about like a month and a half before to within like here, right? So you're like, okay, he's a he's a polished college pitcher. He actually doesn't need this time in the minors. They want to get him past Super 2 status, which is going to, you know, or some status that they're going to lose him a year later. So it's got to be after this range. And they're going to want to bring him up at home. And they're going to want to bring him up against the team that is beatable. And, hey, here's a homestand versus the Pittsburgh Pirates in such and such a month. And that looked pretty good. And so um, so probably like a month and a half before, I would tell my buddy, I was like, okay, get your company seats for the, uh, this Pittsburgh Pirates series. And we got this date. And then, like, there was a couple of rainouts, and they had had to adjust his pitching day. But the other people, at this point, it wasn't on a lot of people's radars, and he was actually able to switch with somebody because he got bumped forward a day or two, and we were able to adjust forward another day. And so we got these tickets, and then they called him up. And, you know, his debut, coming from, like, just the way I can describe it is the fact that he struck out as a rookie 14 guys in his debut, and the scoreboard on the stadium didn't go past 10 and that had never been a problem before. They had never, (laughs) that had never been a situation they had had to deal with, with a home pitcher before, because we just had a staff mainly of soft tossing whoever the heck we can get to put in the team. And so, you know, they were doing the like taping K's up on the wall, but literally the scoreboard just stopped at 10. Right. And, And that just sums up the whole thing completely. I mean, I'm not even kidding. I mean, and uh, I think Bob Costas, they interviewed him afterwards. He said it was one of the top sporting events he had ever been to because it truly was just people being like, oh, my God, it's like we have a legitimately good player finally. You know, other than, I mean, Ryan Zimmerman was always good. But, like, we were – everybody was just hugging each other when he was striking a guy. And it was so unbelievable. They struck out the last three guys. He got better as the game went on. Um, it was just wild. And so it, it was a it was a huge event. It was wonderful. It, it, just one of the indelible sports memories of my life. But that was the Nats, man. Like, the, basically, you just grew with them in baseball the day in, day out. You just know these guys because, they you know, there's so much reporting on it or talking to people um, about what's going on on the team. You get a feel for the personalities, those sorts of things. You can really feel like you're, you know, part of the team or at least sort of like ingrained in the team at points. Um, that you you brought up Brian Zimmerman. Did you feel like you're about the same age as him, a couple years older maybe? But do you, did you did you relate to him through his uh, through his trials and travails of sticking around with a bad team as a good player? I related to him a little bit, and I would constantly run into him at various bars in the region because there were only so many uh, bars in the region, and those guys always went out in Clarendon quite a bit. They all lived in Clarendon because of. Uh, I mean, if you were young and you wanted to pay less tax, you were a millionaire and wanted to pay less taxes, and, and that was the place to go find bars in Clarendon. So they were always in Clarendon Ballroom at nights. And then after um, weekday nights, they I went to GW for law school. They were constantly at McFadden's. Uh, at uh, So I would run into them every once in a while uh, pretty consistently. And what was the funny thing about like DC is that literally nobody would recognize who Ryan Zimmerman was except for like, I guess me, you know, but it, kind of thing in like Boston, if, if, uh, you know, like Mookie Betts were going out in Boston, he would just be mobbed with people and every, you know, Ryan Zimmerman could, could just walk down the middle of the street in DC and everybody be like, no idea who that guy is. Yeah. I used to see, this isn't related to Zimmerman, but I used to see Ovechkin getting, uh, getting groceries at lunch. Um, relatively often like once a month or so and nobody mobbed him like people clearly recognized him but like yeah he lives he lives you know not far in the suburbs but he lives a little bit out and it was it was, it was like a kind of busy place but you know it's sort of like oh there goes that guy and uh you know 
if there is any it, it was like him and his him and his then girlfriend now wife and their friends were usually there and they're just you know picking up high protein meals and they get that kind of slumming it and you're like oh you're gonna go you're gonna go be on tv and score a bunch of hockey goals tonight and i ran into denard span in a cosi the, d- the day before they started their series with the Cardinals that they lost horribly uh, in 2012. Um, and, you know, and it's so funny because he's, he's a center fielder. He's like 6'1", so he doesn't really stand out in the crowd or whatever. And he's just there and he's picking up a bagel. And so, I, you know, I'm leaving him alone. And I'm sitting there thinking through this. I'm like, I'm not going to mess with him, whatever. Uh, he's sitting doing the thing. And then I just started getting more annoyed. I'm like, it's literally the playoff series starts tonight. Nobody <laughs> in this entire town can recognize the, the starting center fielder of like that year, the best team in baseball. Like they had won like 110, 106, 107 games that year or something like that. The best team in baseball. And nobody recognized this guy. So he's walking out and I, I said like, Hey, good luck tonight, man. And he goes, and he gave me like a half hug and said, Oh, thanks man. And walked out. I was like, Oh, that was the be- that was like the best uh, best experience. That's the best possible way that could have gone. So I bet it wasn't the I bet that wasn't the scenario that played out for Juan Soto. I bet he was easily recognizable. I I bet so at that, at that point. I bet so. Um, some of his size, Juan Soto, more recognizable. But yeah, I, I I imagine so. I imagine he was getting would get a little more mobbed. And and the guy they they drafted this year uh, was in my son's class, um, Dylan Cruz, a f- phenomenal talent. Did he make it up by the end of the year? I don't even know. I didn't check. No, he made it to Double A, and then uh, they kind of he the Double A. All right, so their Double A team right now had at the end of the year ended with like two of the top ten prospects in baseball, both outfielders, and then um, like five of the Nats' top like seven prospects were all on this one team in the offense. And so like, anyway, I, I really actually might drive up there next year if they're still there at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, but um, do Hershey during the day and go to see them. But uh, yeah, uh, the future looks pretty good for them. It's, it's, it's going to be impo- It's going to be really difficult to compete with the Braves for a long time because the Braves have so much talent and then they, the talent just keeps signing these long-term cheap deals to stay forever and you're like, oh, what are we going to do about that? If Ronald Acuna is going to stay, I mean, I don't blame Juan Soto at all to get millions and millions of dollars. But like, whoever tricked Ronald Ronald Acuna into signing a deal where he makes like less than league minimum by the end of the deal is just like it's kind of it's just crazy. But um, they're just going to be really really good for a long time. Pat, how how close do you feel like you are to being able to work in baseball tomorrow? Mm, I would say I'm not close at all unless they need sort of like what are their needs as far as disability adjudication? I think. <laughs> um, no, I mean, the thing about baseball is, is uh, so many people would like the concept of working baseball and want to work in baseball that, um, you know, they, they can just say, we'll just pay you almost nothing. And, uh, you know, you work baseball. I mean, yeah, I, you, friends, I mean, you know, people that are working in baseball, I have friends. Uh, working in baseball. Um, yeah. I had uh, one time during a power outage, I spent a brunch sitting next to the guy running the at nationals Twitter account and, uh, you know, uh, workshops and puns to work into the old Twitter feed there. Back when do, Twitter. You, do you feel like you know enough about working in baseball to know that it's it wouldn't be what you wanted it to be? Yeah, I mean, I think in, you could see this in any sort of organization. You know, an organization that the that in every organization there can be a, a wonderful mission, and you can still be surrounded by idiots and a holes, right? <laughs> I mean, just just truly. And uh, I think you know, I mean, I I never played baseball at a, at a high level like you did, Terry. But I I imagine you had probably you know times when you felt like the direction was not a great direction, and maybe or you know, was that ever the case for you? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it. The thing about baseball too is you've mentioned this a couple of times. Even in college, um, eighty games or seventy-five games while trying to be a student, it's it's by far just the number of games, the sheer number of games. It's the hardest sport to play. It's the hardest sport to keep up with. And and it, there's a, a lot of you know cross country travel. It, it, Baseball, the the to be successful, this is one thing people don't understand about the sport. They think the absolute most talented players are the people who play in the major leagues. That's partial truth. 
uh, the people who make it in pro baseball are the grinders. They're the people that have the mental um, discipline that is their primary trait. And all, they're all talented, but the most talented players uh, and they're, the road's littered with them. Like the, the, they just didn't. And this is, I have a, a, a friendly relationship with Dayton Moore. And uh, he told me <laughs> multiple times, he said, the people who want to play baseball are the people who make it to the major leagues. He said, everybody who gets drafted has the talent to do it, but it's the people that want to do the 14 hour bus rides and all of the sort of non uh, glamorous things that go along with minor league baseball. So it's baseball's a grind. Um, there are, as in, as you mentioned uh, in a team sport, and I'm sure it's not unique to baseball. There are, 80%, 85% of the people are cool and, and get along socially in a setting where they know they're forced into it, but 10 or 15% of them don't get the memo and that can make the sport a lot of, uh, not a lot of fun. Ground rule single had a recurring bit, on baseball birthdays, which was actually, you know, is largely a historic perspective on the sport, the culture, fandom of baseball, um, and, and all the history associated with it through the lens of what interesting player has a birthday today. Uh, what, you know, historical baseball player has an interesting story. So there were a lot of, a lot of tales of the troubles of playing baseball that the players brought to their teams, particularly in the, the early and middle days of baseball, where it was um, sure it was a career, but there was also uh, it was a lifestyle decision, if you will. Um, and it's, it's always, it was always very interesting to me to hear baseball birthdays, thinking, think about what did the life of, well, first a baseball player, but more generally, a, a, you know, a pro athlete, what was their day to day? And then how does that compare and how did that, how did that change over time? And was there some equivalent to seeing superstar athletes get in a bagel before the playoffs or grabbing groceries with their family? And, and to what extent was a typical pro athlete, you know, in the, the we call it thirties and forties or something like that, you know, to what extent were they doing a job, putting on an, a show, giving the entertainment when they give the entertainment and then kind of like going back home, whether that was back home at the end of the season or back home at the end of the day, uh, or the end of the game, I, it, it was always fascinating to look at that through the, the lens of baseball birthdays and think about like, could could anybody do what's required now? I mean, it's, it's, it just seems amazing that there's been such a completeness of what it takes to actually be a pro athlete, which to me, again, is like a non sports guy. I'm like, this is entertainment, right? Like you're, you are an entertainer and you, you have to eat, sleep and breathe the thing you're doing all the time, which was not necessarily true in, in the days of, yeah. cleverly nicknamed old baseball stars and, and i mean this is true of so many of the other sports too where the the training camp or the spring training was to literally like get yourself in open back in enough shape. shape that you could play the sport as opposed <laughs> to like just refining and getting better and those sorts of things and terry a lot of the baseball birthdays would be just going through um the the baseball reference and finding whose birthday it was on the day and then finding the just like truly insane stories of you know the baseball player who also robbed a bank while being a baseball player and <laughs> told to be out of town by sundown but a lot of it also is like the the it's an interest it was an interesting cross section too of like what does what do mental health problems look like in the 1930s and it's like oh the guy is a drunk well the guy is a drunk because he has like j just shell shock you know, from World War One, and like, and and uh, is just basically like got severe chronic mental issues that he can only deal with by drinking himself essentially to death, which has happened to so many of these guys. Um, there was one guy who um, just had this congenital inner ear problem where he just constantly was uh, having you know dysphoria and and um, difficulty uh, inertia or, or so nausea and all these sorts of problems, and so he would just like. They were, you would constantly look back at him and he would lose track of where he was in the game and be standing on one foot. And he was highly talented when he was like, you know, like drunk enough that, that the, the, it wasn't bothering or something like that. And he can be in the game, but yeah, uh, just a lot of that. I mean, I would say Russ, it's just like, 
uh, Americans with sports, like anything, it's like we have to take anything and we just have to keep like refining it and refining it and refining it and refining it. And it's almost like you've got to refine it to the point where the the athletes themselves have to do nothing but that. You've got to refine it to the point where like the it has to be everywhere where pervasive in your world and in your life and you've got to have access to every single piece of it and stuff like that. And I would say baseball in particular, the thing that's good about baseball really should be like, there's a game every day, you lose today, you're going to show up tomorrow, you're going to try again, you probably forget like how bad things felt like two games ago when you were on a losing streak and then now you're on a winning streak and things have turned around. It just, I don't know, I feel like baseball is much more conducive to how life really should be of just sort of like take it as it comes, there's ups and there's downs. Um can I ask you a bit of an esoteric question, Pat? Oh yeah, of course. Um, baseball specific. So um, clearly not not a, an angle with this question. I'm just interested in your take. Culturally, um, do you have a position or an opinion on are we better off culturally with Ted Williams in the middle of what was probably as good a career as there was to that point? Babe Ruth probably, but Ted Williams was there being shipped off to fight, uh, in world war two smack in the middle of his prime, uh, of his career. That's one cultural sort of bookend. The other is, you know, hundred million dollar players today that would not have that same. Uh, uh, is there, is one better than the other? Are we culturally better? And, and, I have a tendency, just full disclosure, I have a tendency, Russ tells me, to be the old guy that screams at kids to get off his lawn. So that may be part of this perspective, but I, I think it's, um, you know, culturally is society better when guys have to, you know, athletes have to come into spring training to get in shape because they've been working real jobs and they've been shipped off to war in the prime of their careers. Are, which cultural situation do you think is better or at least, type, you know, conceptually? Yeah, no, I know. It's it's more of like, uh, which do I prefer? Or it's it's hard to say because I almost feel like, you know, uh, Americans. We well, I don't want to say Americans. I say people. We have a we have such a need to be part of something, to be part of some group, to identify with some group. And I wonder if, like, okay, in the Ted Williams situation. Maybe there was less emphasis on being the diehard, be all, end all Red Sox, but there was certainly at the time all this great emphasis on everyone is part of the American war effort, right? And all these sorts of things. And so, and believe me, the, you know, the American war effort at the time, very necessary and, and, and uh, to ensuring the way of life that we have right now. But all that to say, like, it's, it's like you can have one team at a time that is your, your sort of superseding team. And so the Ted Williams war effort, everybody is going to do that. He would have been run out of town if he had not done that. You know, you'd see the flack given to sort of uh, people like Muhammad Ali and uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and all sorts of people who wouldn't sort of like fit in as much into the box of, oh, you've got to be in the homogenistic American society for, for all of this. And that homogenistic society put America number one and these other interests, number two. And now I would say we've sort of, sort of, as you've alluded to, America and sort of these broader teams have sort of displaced more into what are our own interests? What are our, what is our individual interest? And it's called, it's what I find is interesting is then it causes us to then pick something to turn into our thing that we like as much as America, right? And so now you've got people who they believe the Dallas Cowboys are America, you know, and it's like, well, yeah, but there's New York Giants fans. And I, do they believe the Giants are America, you know, and so it's almost like uh, we Americans, we have this obsession. It's going to go to something and it's either going to go here or it's going to go here. Uh, aesthetically, like I, I think some level of, you know, fandom is 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 uh, kind of unhealthy <laughs> at some point. Um, but, you know, I mean, being, you know, sort of like slavishly devoted to an overarching ideal of like Americans, perfect American society in some way that it wasn't actually perfect for the peop other people, unless you were sort of like of a specific demographic at the time. Um, it wasn't perfect for you. And so like, you know, it just humans, that's the trap we always fall into have to be 
you know, loyal to some team. That's the team of America, or it's the team of the team that we're putting in place of America, or it's a religion or something else. Like, we're just going to find that thing and focus on it. I'm going to, I want to do a, I want to do a rundown of baseball questions okay. to take us out. Here's how this is going to work. Are you guys ready? <laughs> I have a series of questions and I'm going to ask them of both of you. And I'm going to say the question and then I'm going to say one of your names to answer first. And then when you're done, the next one goes and they need to be short. I need you to answer in one to two sentences at most. Are you ready for this? Ready. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with a softball here. Hot dogs or Italian sausage? Pat, go first. Italian sausage. Italian sausage. Uh, do you sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game out loud while at a game? Terry. Never. <laughs> Pat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, grown man, baseball glove at, at a baseball game. Yes or no? Terry. Who's the attendee list with the grown man? Pat. If you're with a kid. All right. So same answer, basically. Uh, what's the best stadium in the MLB? Back to Terry. Oh, Fenway. <laughs> Freaking Homer. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> Five. Four. Three. Can't answer. Oh, it's not Nats Park. Uh, I w- it would have been an easy one if it had been. If... An, an oppose, uh, the opposing team hits a home run. Do you throw it back, Pat? If you're a Chicago Cubs fan, Terry. Depends on the player. A lot of waffling, you guys. Okay. Uh, <laughs> p- pitch clock. Yes or no, Terry? Yes. Pat. Yes. Uh, when will be the next steroid era, Terry? It's now. It's just it, it. It's not traceable steroids. There are a lot of different things that are performance enhancing, and I don't think that's a problem, personally. It's a complex answer. Yeah, Patrick, do you care to f- try and follow that up? I agree with Terry. It's there's always been something. The entire length of somebody's always going to look for an edge, and somebody always will. And it's either this or that, or it'll be computer chips in your brain next, or something like that. There just it just will always be a thing. And pretending like it wasn't a thing before is... Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, please keep the answer in the form of a short answer. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> when is the next steroid era? Yes. Okay. Uh, calling balls and strikes, computers or humans? Patrick. L- call, both. Uh, I would do... Uh, a uh, human umpire, but um, a computer in the background that does red or green if it's just completely ridiculously wrong. You've thought this through. Terry? Um, I prefer Catholicism, the ritualism of Catholicism with a different uh, ideology. I would say I want to see people, but with a computer embedded into their eyeball. (laughs) So I might be waiting for a while. So you want an Android? You want hap- You want an OK computer robot umpire? Exactly the same as Patrick. I just want both. Most yeah. people uh, would be OK with you doing unlicensed surgery on Angel Hernandez right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. <laughs> Earliest inning you've ever left a game, Terry? Um, so my daughter and I went to a AAA game in Louisville about a month ago, and we made it through four. Oh, that's not bad, Pat. Uh, not not rainouts, right? I've been no rainouts. New game, but uh, baby, three innings. Uh, three innings was the most the baby could make. Hey, you were a champ for even going, Patrick. Thanks so much for being on uh, Happy Job Records, Terry. Thanks for entertaining my my friend Pat for uh, what, for an so episode. I want to ask while he's under the pressure of yeah yeah only these three sets of eyeballs. We've got to have him back very soon to talk about other things because I. I didn't know Patrick was such an interesting person. Here's so. the so here's the list I've got. Uh, we got to do, I mean, we're going to have to do a second baseball episode because we barely scratched the surface. So we're going to have to have him, have him back for baseball. Oh, a Prefer- recur- a recurring baseball episode, but we've got to have we've got to leave we've got to a lot time for more esoteric things. You need you need to hear about AI from him. 
a lot of things, a ton of things. Like I'm sitting here thinking, okay, the baseball conversation is interesting, but there are like 40 other directions I'd like to like to take this man and let him explain things to us. I want to hear about the the world's largest legal system that you've never heard of. And that's actually all the time we have (laughs) today, guys. So we're going to call Pat back on for another interesting talk sometime soon. (laughs) Thanks. Nice to to meet you, Pat. Take care. Have a great day. Bye. You too.